okay so uh, the mathematics have changed let's look at the calculus from a point of view of a problem that I've taken out of the textbook okay and it's in there uh, what we have here is a piece of metal 12 centimeters by 20 centimeters you can see it here and uh, what we're going to do is cut the corners out of this thing so that we can fold up the side and make a box um, we can make the box either very wide and shallow by having a small value of x or we can make it with a small base and tall if we increase the value of x can you, you picture what that box would look like if we changed x of course if I'm going to make a box out of this thing then oops then this x here must be the same there and there why didn't it do it when I did it last time it did but it stopped doing it this time I can't zoom in on that x bit but never mind um, if that's one side is x the other side must be x because they've got to meet when they fold up so what I have is a problem where I can change the value of x and make either a wide shallow box or a small based tall box and you find if you um, plot a graph of um, the volume of this box against x the volume changes if x was zero the volume would be zero and as I increase the value of x the volume increases but you find actually and we'll look as we go through this problem at the function and plot it you find that there's a maximum value of the volume now if you were trying to manufacture a box to hold a liquid or a powder or something like that you'd want to know what that maximum volume was so you could make the box to maximize the materials you got wouldn't you and you are the engineer in the department and you've been asked to come up with a value of x that will give the maximum volume of the box and if you've done any calculus before you will know that finding maximum values involves calculus okay so before we can use the calculus though what we need to do is come up with a formula that relates the volume with x and then we can do something with it we can apply calculus the rules of calculus to it so the first step is to come up with a formula what's the general formula for the volume of a box anybody length times width times height or depth times width times height yeah so what we call L what we call W and what we call H is entirely up to us but to me the length would be the 20 centimeter dimension the width would be the 12 centimeter dimension and the height would be the X okay but it's up to you what you call what uh, what is L the length of the box in terms of X right 20 take away 2x and does that make sense looking at this diagram can you see where that comes from 20 minus 2x why is it 20 minus no the length equals 20 minus 2x yeah yeah exactly that's right I've got 20 altogether and I'm going to take away two lots of x's at one either end as Daniel says to get the length agreed Dan so 12 minus 2x will be the width and the height would be x okay now what I'm going to do is just record uh, pauses so how are we going to do this well 20 times 12 so I'm going to multiply out this bracket with this bracket agree then Daniel yeah so right so 20 times 12 is 240 yep 20 times minus 2x is minus 40x yep minus 2x times 12 minus 24x minus 2x times minus 2x is plus 4x squared but then that's all times by x oh, yeah yes but 
Uh, well, you mean could, you're going to times that by x? Yes, I could have taken either of these brackets and times them by x first and then done this. It doesn't matter what order you do it in. Minus 2x times minus 2x. Oh, yeah, well done, Mason. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well done. Is that what you're about to say, Jordan? Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, so now um, what I could do at this point, of course, is pause and go back and make sure I don't make that mistake. But now I'll carry on. All right, so the volume equals now I times every term inside this bracket by x. 240x. Minus, of course, I can combine these two. 40x minus 24x is minus 64x squared plus 4x cubed. Don't need the bracket anymore, actually. But leave it in a bracket as I started and I'll finish. Common to put terms involving the highest power of x on the left and working down in the powers. So... Finally, volume equals 4x cubed minus 64x squared plus 240x. And we have a cubic equation because the highest power of x is x cubed. So this is a cubic to find the volume. Now what I want to do is to apply the rules of calculus to this and differentiate it, as it's called, differentiate the function. Before I do that, though, what I want to do is look at this function, v equals 4x cubed minus 64x squared plus 240x. So, putting this function into autograph, then start up autograph, hit equals to put the equation in. It doesn't recognise v as a variable, so I have to use y, so I type in y for the volume, equals, what was it, 4x cubed? And if I hit the x three times, I get x cubed. What was the next term, somebody? Minus 64x squared, hitting the x twice again, plus 240x. And I hit OK, and I get the function. Now, it's all squashed into a a small area, so what I need to do is to zoom in on this x-axis and hopefully it will start to expand out. Now, something weird going on here. 4x cubed minus 64x squared plus 240x. I shouldn't be getting a straight line like this. Let me zoom out. Have I missed part of it? Going on, is it curving off at all? Ah, here we go. There we go. There's a function. So here's the function drawn out. This is the volume of the box as x varies. So let's look at this function for a sec. On the x-axis, we're plotting x, the height of the box. The y-axis is plotting the volume of the box. And you can see. There's a point at which the volume is a maximum. Around here somewhere, uh, the volume is a maximum. Again, I can't do this. Perhaps we use this. Yeah, around about here somewhere, the volume is a maximum. Um, when x equals zero, the volume is zero. Does that make sense? Yeah. Ah, well, yeah, we'll come to that. Yeah, but good question, John. So as x starts to increase, we reach a maximum value, but then at this point here, when x equals 6, the volume drops again to 0. The volume drops again to 0. Does that fit in with our picture? Right, exactly. No, so there's no base at all, and we've got no volume. Well done, that's exactly right. So it should drop to 0. And of course, what's happening after that is, mathematically, um, this software has got no clue that this is actually a real volume of a box. So it just carries on. Well, what would happen if it was greater than x? You'd have a negative. And so it makes no sense in the real world, but it carries on plotting the function. And it also goes to the left over here and plots negative values for x as well. So we're only interested in, effectively, this part of the, the function here. So if I 
um, take this part of the function and just put it into my notes, that's the bit I'm interested in. This is the real part of the curve. Now, we're, we're going to make a few notes on this in a little while, but when we find the differential of the function, again, those of you who've done calculus before will know that what we're finding is the gradient of the function at a time. So the differential tells me what the gradient is. What's the gradient here? What's the slope of the curve? What's the gradient here? And uh, so on. I'm interested in this point of the curve. What's the gradient at that point? What's the gradient of this line? That's how I find it, Danny, but what is it? Zero. It's a horizontal line. So the gradient at this point, zero. Okay, the gradient is zero at that point on the curve. So what I do is I use calculus. So use calculus, or in this actually we call it differential calculus. on our function to find a new function and the new is an important word new function it's nothing to do with the, well it is related to the original function but it's a whole new function which tells me the gradient of the original function. Differential calculus applied to a function gives me a new function which tells me the gradient of the original function. We'll talk briefly about how it does that, but that's not important to us as an engineer. It's all set out in the textbook so you can look at it. Calculus from first principles, the beginning of the chapter, goes through how it works. But really all we're interested in is the fact that applying these little rules, and they do turn out to be quite straightforward, often you can just write down the answer, gives us a new function which gives us the gradient of the original function and that's what we're after in this case we're after the gradient and we're more particularly we're after the point at which the gradient drops to zero so the method to find the maximum volume is 1 differentiate and 2 find when this the differential is 0 In other words, the gradient is zero. And that's what we're going to do. Just to recap then, let's just look at this again, because I went through that quite quickly. Let's go back to the beginning. So this calculus is about the mathematics of change, okay? So we introduce it by looking at a problem. A changing situation. What's changing here? The volume of the box as x varies, v, change, v varies. So there's some change going on. So the first thing to do before we can use this count is to come up with a formula that relates what we're interested in. In this case, it's the volume of the box 
and the height x. So a little bit of algebra comes in straight away. We, where is it? Oh yeah, down here. So we write down the formula for the volume of the box, multiply out the brackets, and come up with this. It can become obvious in a second why we've done that, because of course this is a formula for the volume of the box involving just x. But that's not in a form, as we'll see in a moment, that's easy to differentiate, use the calculus rules on. So what we do is we expand out the brackets and rewrite this formula for the volume of the box like that. And now it is easy to differentiate. So that's why we did that. So we've got a formula that relates to volume and x. If we plot this function, we get this. So we can see that for the real part of the curve that we're interested in, um, that the volume changes with x. And that there is a maximum volume. And if we had the software, we could come up with it. It looks as though it's around about two and a half centimeters, something like that. But we can come up with an exact value using the calculus, buying a la find, differentiating it, and then finding where this gradient is zero, which is what we've said down here. Okay, so let's do that now. So let's take our original function, which is going back to here, this. So let's copy this and stick it in here. Right, differentiate it. Now, again, the, the notation we'll talk about in a little while, but the differential function is written like this. dv by dx is how you say it, dv by dx. And this now is the differential function, the new function. And the notation is dv by dx. As soon as you do that, you know it's a differential. Yeah, that's right. Equals, now I'm just going to write down the answer and we'll talk about why it's this afterwards. So, 12x squared minus 128x plus 240. The rule of calculus here is so easy that once I know it and once you know it, you can just write down the answer. There's nothing to do. That's the calculus now done. We've got a new function. Here it is that um, describes the rate of change of the original function. So this is the rate of change of volume. V with x, or with height, x. And that's what that notation means, dv by dx, the rate of change of v with x, or volume with height in this case. So that's step one done. We've differentiated it and come up with a new function. Now all we need to do is find when this rate of change, this gradient, is zero. So for step two, we let the dv dt dv dx, thank you Mason, find when dv by dx equals zero. So in other words, 12x squared minus 128x plus 240 equals zero. And that's a quadratic equation. We've just been looking at those things in the exam you've just done. You could try and factorize it, or you could use the quadratic formula. So I suggest we use the quadratic formula in this case. And so we use A equals b equals and c equals, and then we're going to use x equals minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So what does a equal? Right, it's the coefficients of the x squared term, isn't it then? Yeah. B is minus 128. Don't forget the minus sign. 
and C is 240. So, sorry? No, it's the, this A is the coefficient of x squared. Do you remember this, this formula goes with the general quadratic AX squared plus BX plus C equals zero. So in other words, A is the number in front of the X squared term. B is the number in front of the X term. And C is the number on its own. So if I just, again, I'll pause the recording for a few minutes, plug these numbers into the uh, that formula and come up with the values for X. There will be two values, don't forget, because whenever you find, solve a quadratic, there's two answers. So plugging the numbers into the formula, you get X equals 2.43 or 8.24. And if we look at, again, you know, have to have a look at that later. If you didn't get that, play with it later, but don't worry about that now. Okay, so let's just move on. Uh, looking back at this uh, function, and if we look back to the autograph that we looked at originally, note two, value, two points at which the gradient drops to zero. And so we're only interested in this one, but the quadratic equation, when we solved it, gives us both. Damn. Focus here for a sec. So can you see that two values where the gradients drop to zero? 2.43 looks like and 8 point something looking at the curve. So those are our two solutions. So the only one that makes any real sense to us is the first solution. So that's the one we go for. So um, going back to here again, that's the one we're after. So the value of x that gives the greatest volume is 2.43 centimetres. So can we find that volume? Substitute it in, yep. Yeah. So going back to our original function, the volume equals 4x cubed, wasn't it? Minus 64x squared, if I remember rightly, plus 240x. So substituting that value of x and we get the volume is somebody. So the volume is 241.08, presumably cubic centimetres as we're working in centimetres. Is that an appropriate accuracy? Probably not. Going back to the original problem, we had 12 centimetres and 20. So two significant figures is probably appropriate. 240 cubic centimetres to two significant figures. Oh, did he? All oh, right, we have another answer, 262, so it might be that. All right, that sounds more like it. Thanks, Mason, just messed up my notes. All right, okay. Anyway, okay. So, calculus is useful, and that's one example. I thought I'd started off with the example of how calculus could be useful. That's called using a maximum minimum volume because we can find maximum and minimum values of a function. Here's the function that we were looking at originally um, using calculus. Oh. So if we put that in our notes, so we can use calculus. to find maximum and minimum values of a function.
because at those points the gradient is zero. Well, we've got a volume of about 200 and we said about 260, so it is, right? Yeah. Well, we, we didn't bother with this result, did we? Do you remember? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Let's have a look now at these little rules. How did I arrive at this when I did the differentiation? This part here. How did I get this? You know, what are the rules? What are the rules of calculus? Quite straightforward rules, because I did that without any extra working. I just put down the answer. But what are they? Yep. Yeah, okay. So we'll look at those now and write down the rules for everybody. Okay? So a table of standard differentials um, would be appropriate at this point. So what are the rules for differentiation? Right, now you've got all this, you know, some of you know all this already, but let's write them down. Um, I'm going to be focusing a bit more on the um, notation than I may have done in the past, so you could well learn something from this, even if we've done all this before. So let's have a look, okay? So first of all, a word on notation. If I write, there's two ways I can write a function. And so let's split the board and um, write those two ways, one on the left and one on the right. first way is how I might write this function if I was going to plot a graph of it. For example, um, y equals ax is a function. <coughs> so if I plotted a graph of this, I would have, as you know, y on the vertical axis and x on the horizontal axis. So that's how I'd represent the function if I was going to plot a graph. What we always put on the x-axis is what's called the independent variable. So x is the independent variable, and y is the dependent variable, because it depends on x. So we have always two variables, the dependent and the independent variable. It doesn't have to be y and x, it could be v and t, or v and s, or lots of different letters can be used, theta for temperature, t for time, common variables that are used. If you think of any engineering scenario where we do an experiment or something like that, we're always going to control one variable, and that will be the x variable, we'll control the temperature or we'll control the time, something like that, and we'll observe the effect of that on something else. So if we were controlling the temperature, we might be observing what happens to the resistance or something. And that would be the dependent variable. So this is the variable that we observe. The observed variable. And that's a general scientific convention. That we have two variables that are important in any situation. The independent one that we control and the dependent one that we're observing. Of course, in a situation there's going to be loads of variables. 
So if I'm going to change the temperature and observe the effect of that on the resistance, what happens to all the other variables? In an experiment, if I'm controlling one and observing another, what do I do with all the others? Keep them constant. Yeah. Okay. There's a people confuse the independent variable with keeping things constant. That's not what it means. The independent variable is the one that we control. The dependent variable is the one that we observe. All the others are kept constant. So that's in a scientific scenario. In an engineer, you'll often use this format because it lends itself perfectly to, to a graph. And if you're going to um, use this method, then the differential is given by carrying this line down um, dy by dx. And always the dependent variable goes on top and the independent variable goes on the bottom. So how does y change with x? dy by dx. What's the rate of change of y as I change x? What's the rate of change of y with x? I change x, what happens to y? Controlling x, what happens to y? What's the rate of change? And that's the gradient. Do you think about it? Okay. So that's one notation that we use to represent things when we're talking about functions to do with calculus in, in, in any way, one way. The other um, convention that's used is this. It doesn't have to be F. In some ways, it probably would be a good idea not to use F because F stands for function, but so does G in this situation. So F of X equals AX, G of X equals A of X. This is uh, quite a nice convention because it's telling me on the left-hand side here, this FX here, it's telling me that the x is the independent variable. So this f function, there's something happening to what? To x. And that involves a change in it. If we look at the right-hand side of this function, there's two letters there, a and x. And so what that's telling me is that x is the variable, the independent variable in this situation, and a must be a constant. Okay. This function here, the g function, x is the independent variable. So looking at what the function tells me to do, which is just multiply the independent variable by a constant, x is the independent variable, a is the constant. So that convention is used. And if I wanted to plot a graph of it, I would have, again, x on the independent variable axis, and this would be f of x, or g of x, up here. And now, the differential is given by f prime x or g prime x. So the prime, this symbol here, prime, like a dash, okay, uh, means the differential. And that's much quicker to write than this, isn't it? So it's a convention that's used, you know. If I want to represent a function fx, the differential is f prime x. If I want to represent the function y equals ax, I have to write dy by dx using this notation. So 
There's pros and cons for both. I'm more familiar with this one, I must admit, I tend to stick to this one. Yeah, that is represents the differential. Dash. So if you see a function, this here, if you see g prime x, like that, the prime means it's the differential of the g function. It'll become clear as we look at some examples, hopefully. Okay. So let's. Um, so now I'd like to produce a table of some common functions on their differentials. It would be a good idea to have this on a separate piece of paper and you can put it in the front of your notes so we can refer to it because this table of common differentials we'll be using a lot. So put them on a separate piece of paper. And leave the table open-ended because there might be some more we want to add on to it as time goes by. So this is the function y equals, or if you're going to use the convention g of x, then the differential will be dy by dx using the left-hand notation or g prime x. So in here, I want to write the function, but on the left-hand side, leave room to put in some uh, examples. So the first and the most common type of function is something like this. For example, And then a few other common functions, the sine of ax, the cosine of ax, the exponential function, um, and then I'm going to put in a couple of special cases. Um, ax to the power n, yes John. And then let's have a look at uh, one or two special cases at the bottom, which are always tripping people up. So those are some common functions down the left that we come across a lot, the sine function, the cosine function, the exponential function, the natural logarithm function, and then a couple of special cases at the bottom. So for example, sine 2x, cosine 3x, e to the 5x, um, in fact, in this one, I should have written log of ax. For example, the log of um, 3x. And then maybe 5x, a number in front, and then just a number on its own. Is what they stand for. So, the first function, the rule, and again, if you want to look at how the rules arrived at, look at the first chapter on calculus, differential calculus in the textbook. And it takes you to, in, by first principles, how this rule's arrived at. And it's quite an interesting thing to look at. We could spend a session on that, but we're not going to. 
So we're just going to write down the rule and accept it as that's the rule that you use because that's what everyone does. And luckily, if you look at it from first principle, it looks and it is quite an awkward thing to follow, but it turns out to be a very simple rule when you've done it in the end. All that happens is you bring the power down, whatever it is, and multiply it by the number in front and take one off the power. So for this example, I would multiply the 5 by the 3 to get 15 and take 1 off 3 to get 2. So the differential of 5x cubed is 15x squared. As simple as that, if you know the rule and remember the rule. So not complicated, okay? Uh, the next rule, sine changes to a cosine function and the number comes out and goes in front. So a cos ax is the rule. So in this example, the 2 comes out and goes in front, the sine changes to a cosine, and the rest stays the same, 2x in sine. The next rule is that the cos changes to a sine, but it goes to minus sine, so minus a sine ax. So for this example, minus 3 sine 3x. So that, don't worry. The next one, the a comes out and goes in front e to the ax. The rest stays exactly the same. And so for this example we get 5 e to the 5x. This one's an interesting one. It just turns out to be 1 over x. Regardless of what number there is inside of the logarithmic function, that disappears. So what's the log of 3x? 1 over x. Uh, good question. So for, say I had a 3 in front of here, 3 log 3x, three then I'd have 3 over x because the 3 would stay there. So yeah, thanks for that, Daniel. Good point. Here, assuming that that number is 3y. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So next one, a couple of special cases to finish off with, but the rule, the first rule here applies. If I think about this, what is the power of x as it stands 1? So take 1 away from 1, it's 0. So I'm just left, in fact, with the number, which is a. So if I've got something like 5x, the x disappears, and I'm just left with the number in front. So that's a special case of the first rule, really. And the last one, if there is no x at all, there's just a number, then the differential is zero. So any number, what's the differential? Zero. And there are others. There are other types of functions that we'll come across, and we can add them to the list gradually as we go along. If you find ones you're using fairly regularly, add them to the list. But these are the common ones. What's the table of differentials. Yeah, of common differentials. Uh, 
Right. right, carrying on then. So here's our table of differentials, comma differentials. You need to get used to using these um, and get to know them. You'll know some of them after a while. I'm sure some people who've had done the calculus with me before will know some of these off by heart by now. Yep, you get a table in the exam with the standard common differentials in them, so yeah. But it probably wouldn't include things like these, you know, these special cases at the bottom. You expected to remember them, okay? But I put them on so that they don't trip you up to start off with. So let's have a look at some examples and um, talk about what this tells us again. So <coughs> remember the differential... tells us something new. It tells us the rate of change of the original function. So it's an important tool to us as engineers. And we've seen right at the start of today one example of that. We can use the fact that this differential gives us a rate of change because I want a maximum value. And at that point, the rate of change is dropped to zero. It's maximum. So I use this new function and then find out when that's zero. Um, just on this idea of this new function telling us something about the original function, let's just look at the sine and the cosine functions. Don't bother to write this down. Let's just have a look at them. They're here in the notes. The um, red function here is, I shouldn't tell you, you should be able to tell me, is that, what sort of function is this red function, would you say? What does it look like? Sorry? In fact, if I go back to autograph where I got this from, there it is, the red function. What does it look like? Sine wave. Why do you know it's a sine wave, Mason? That's one big clue. Apart from the fact that it says it's at the bottom, sine waves start at zero. zero. Yep. Yeah. So the red function is a sine wave. Red function is a sine wave. The blue function is a cosine wave, which starts at one. Now, if you look at our table of differentials and we look at the differential of the sine wave, it turns out to be to do with the cosine wave. And the differential of the cosine wave turns out to be to do with the sine wave. You remember the differential tells us the rate of change. So if we look at these functions, what that's saying is, if we look at this point on the graph here in the middle, what's the rate of change of this sine function at that point? It's given by the cosine function. So it's 1. What's the gradient of the sine wave at the origin? 1. What's the gradient of the sine function here at this point? 0. If you look at the cosine function, you can see it's 0. And you can see it is that this point here, we've got the gradient has dropped to 0, hasn't it? So that's confirmed by looking at the curve and so on. If I come down here, what's the gradient of this sine function at this point? Well, if we look at it, it's negative. It's a negative gradient. If we look down here, we'll see that it's down here. So the negative gradient is nearly negative 1. So it's gone negative. So you can see the cosine function at that point has gone negative, and so on. So the cosine function describes the rate of change of the sine function. If we look at the, it the other way around, what about... The cosine function, the sine function, describes that look. What is the rate of change of the cosine function at this point? Zero. And you can see it is. 
However, if we look at the rate of change of the cosine function, say here, say here, it is given by the sine function, but the sine's wrong. Look, at this point, the cosine function gradient is negative, but if we look at the sine function at this point, it's here, looking across to here. So it does tell us the gradient of the sine of the cosine function, but the sine's wrong, which is why we need to put a minus sign in front. So, if we look at the table, what's the difference of the cosine function minus the sine function? Is the relationship always the same? How do you mean, John? In terms of they to yeah, sine is always cos and cos is always sine. Yes, that's right. And the, we sort of that picture starts to explain why. Okay, so it turns out that some of these functions like this are their the differential of the sine is cos and the cos is sine. The exponential function is an interesting one. We've talked about exponentials before. An exponential function is one where the rate of change of the function depends on the amount of there is, isn't it? That's the exponential function. And the rate of change, of course, is the differential. So the exponential function is the only one that's its own differential. What's the differential of e to the x, where a is 1? e to the x. It's its own differential. We just have to multiply that differential by a constant factor. If there's an, an a in there, that changes the value of the gradient by this constant factor. So I have to times it by the 5 in that example. And so on. There's a few other functions there. But there is a, there is a relationship between them. I hope that didn't come up on the video. Probably did. Right, so, um, okay. Right, so we've got a table of differentials. We know that the differential gives us a new function which tells us about the rate of change. And we've looked at one or two examples, the sine and the cosine function, how they're related. And we've looked at a problem where we can use calculus. What I want to do now is just give you a little bit of time to just practice these little rules doing some basic differentiation. There is one other thing that is going to come useful for you, though, that I need to give you before we start. And this is another table that I want to add to your table of differentials so you can refer to it. And it's something that we've looked at already. And those of you who have done calculus with me before, you know how important these are. You might even already have that little table of laws of indices. So let's just write them down so you've got them with you. And I'm going to just write the important ones that for calculus. And the, that's these. You can tell me because you've just done an exam in this, so you've all been revising hard and you know what these are. What does that equal? Silence. X to the n over n. Thank you, Mason. M is the underneath because, Andy, it's the root. And roots go into the ground. Okay? For example, the cube root of x squared equals x to the 2 over 3. No, it's a separate table, yeah. Why do we need that rule? Because if I'm giving something like this to differentiate, I can't differentiate it in this form. It has to be in this form to be able to differentiate it. In other words, if I've got y equals cube root of x squared, then I first of all have to rewrite that as y equals x to the two thirds, and then I can differentiate it using that first rule. So using the first rule, write down what you think the answer is. What does the rule tell us to do? Put in the answer. 
And I'll, okay, let's have a look. So, dy by dx. What do I do? I bring the power down, times it by the number in front. No number in front, it's a 1. So 1 times 2 thirds is 2 thirds. x to the power, 2 thirds take away 1. 2 thirds take away 1 is the same as 2 thirds take away 3 thirds, because a whole one is like 3 thirds. 2 thirds take away 3 thirds. Minus a third. So I have two thirds x to the minus one third. Just applying the laws of laws of uh, calculus and the rules of indices, that's the answer. Just apply the rule. Looks really complicated, but that's all it is. Bring the power down, times it by the number in front, take one off the power. Of course, minus means the inverse from the laws of indices, and a third means the cube root, so I can finish this off by saying dy by the x equals 2 over 3 times the cube root of x. Now, you're going to get a chance to practice in a minute. I want, I want you to write this down as an example to refer back to. But why is the third uh, minus? Two thirds take away three thirds. Two minus three is minus one, minus a third. And that minus means we're instantly talking about an inverse, so it goes underneath. Okay, so that's one rule of indices that really comes in handy when we're using it with the rules of calculus. Okay, have that as an example. One more example, and then I'll leave you to get on with some. And then, okay, so the other rule of indices that's handy to know is this one: one over x to the n is x to the Again, you've been revising half of this exam, and it's all still in there, so you remember it. Minus n. Were you going to say that? Have confidence, have confidence. Okay? The inverse is the negative power. So, example. Y equals... 3 over x to the 4. If I'm asked to differentiate that, I can't differentiate it in this form. I have to rewrite it using the laws of indices. And I get y equals 3x to the minus 4 because the inverse is a negative power. Now I apply that first rule. Bring the power down, times it by the number in front, take one off the power. Write down what you think the answer is. And I will pause this and then... Right, so, what do we do? Bring the power down, minus 4 times 3. Of course, now we've got a new function, the differential, so the notation. Minus 12, thank you, Andrew. X to the... Minus 5, Andrew. Minus 4 minus 1 is minus 5. Don't fall into that trap. Minus, of course, means inverse. So, I find I can call it minus 12. Divided by x to the 5. They are the same, but... You might well want to see it written like that or like that, and it's certainly worth being able to recognise that they are the same thing. Okay. Okay. Right. Now, in the textbook, go to... You, you need your textbook, so go to... Let me just... Um, 
pause this. Right. Okay. So exercise one sixty page four ten. Question number two, which is y equals square root of x. Agreed? Okay. Using the laws of indices, that is a two and that's a one because by convention we don't bother to put the two in for a square root and we don't bother to put the one for x to the power one. So using the laws of indices, y equals x to the half. That's the first step. You cannot differentiate in the first form as you're given it in this situation. So I have to use the laws of indices to rewrite it as a power. And then I use that first rule. And the first rule says, bring the power down and times it by the number in front. No number in front, so it must be a 1. So it will be a half of x. And the next bit, a half take away a half, is minus a half. Think of it, a half take away a whole one is the same as a half take away two halves, which is minus one half, isn't it? Are we happy with that, Dan? Yeah, the value of all of that the first step here. From there to there? Yeah. yeah. If you put that two in front of there, I understand the one to be x to power one. Yeah, but not the two. Only because it's like a convention. We don't bother to put the two in all the time because it's usually the square root we're finding so the two we just don't bother to write in it's laziness no square implies the word two doesn't it or the letter the number two in a way so the square root if there's no number there at all it's taken as red that that means a square root so that should be a two okay dan are you happy with this yeah a half. Um, the rule, which is here, tells me, this rule is the one I'm applying, Dan, and it's telling me that to differentiate, I bring the power down and times it by the number in front, and then take one of the power. So if you look at the example, I brought the 3 down and times it by the 5 to get 15, and then I took one off 3 to get 2. Okay, And so I've just applied that here directly, I brought the power down and times it by the number in front, which is a half, and then a half take away one is minus a half. And now that is the answer, that is the thing differentiated, okay? So that is the function, that is the differential function, but quite often we want to write it in third form, as it's called. So the next few steps don't add to the differential, they don't change the function, but they just change the way we write it, the function, okay? And so it's worth getting to know it. And remembering that minus means the inverse. So this is the same as saying a half times 1 over x to the half. So multiplying out these two fractions, we get 1 times 1 is 1 over 2 times x to the half. So that becomes 1 over 2x to the half. We can almost jump straight from this step to this step by just putting the x to the half underneath. Yeah, no, it's not a half. It's not half x. It's a half times x to the minus a half. And x to the minus a half can be written as one over x to the half using the law of indices. So then that we get to here, and now x to the half is the square root of x, so finally we can rewrite that as 1 over 2 times the square root of x. Now that's the sort of algebra that having done it as long as I have, you could do it easily, you know, but you need to learn these little things. Yeah, that's right. No number at all. No, that's the end of the square root I've written there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it actually, it could be there because that does mean it. If there's no power, it means 1. So, yeah. Okay, that's that one. Let's look at number three. So what does question three say? X equals the square root. Okay, well, let's do X equals the square root of T to the three. 
Okay, first thing. Um, yeah, use the law of indices, yep, so we rewrite this as x equals t to the power over the root, which is a 2, yes, because there's no number there, John, so that means the square root, so that must be a 2. The root, that's going to be one two. yep, that's right, so now I'm going to differentiate, I've used the wrong letter for the dependent variable, but never mind. dx by dt equals what? Power down times by the number in front. Yeah, but before I do that, 3 over 2 times 1 is 3 over 2. t to the what's three halves take away one yeah it's three over two power down times by the number in front that's what the rule tells me to do here John no number in front is a one it is like the last one that's exactly what I did on the last one look I brought the power down and times it by the number in front ah brought the power down times it by the number in front three over two No. You happy with that, John? Yeah. 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 It's 3 over 2 times 1. It's 3 over 2. Yeah. yeah, now the power. What's 3 halves take away 1? No. 3 halves take away 2 halves is a half. Daniel, isn't it? So the power, a half. And the half is the square root. So I can finally rewrite this as 3 over 2 times the square root of t. And that's probably the answer in the book. If you get from you the power of half there. Yep. And you go from that to the square root. Yeah. Because if we think about that, that law of indices that we wrote earlier, the power is the top number in the fraction and the root is the bottom number in the fraction. And conventionally, we never bother to put this 1 and 2 in. It's just a square root of t. Okay. okay. We're referring back to um, these, look. This is the law of indices that's being used here. The mth root of x to the n is written as x to the m over n. So x to the 1 over 2 would be written as the square root of x to the 1, or the square root of x, okay? But it's just down to practice these things, John. So what's the next one? Okay. That I can differentiate. That's just a constant, so that's in our table of differentials. And if we're going to do a differential, we do each one in turn. That one I can't differentiate as it stands. What would I do with this term so I could differentiate it? Yes, so how do I rewrite it? Nope. Andy? X to the power of minus 3. Because the inverse is a negative power. And then we use the laws of indices. Uh, sorry, the laws of differentiation to, to finish that. So see if you can work, finish that one off. Yeah, that's right. Constants disappear. Okay, I'll leave you to carry on with that one. And then... Right. Try these, okay?
Just try those out, okay? Ones to just get you going on them, a bit like the first ones. <laughs> 